<laughs> Wastelanders, Vault Dwellers, welcome. Welcome back. This is the Fallout Lorecast. This is your host, Tom, or Robots. And um, this is <laughs> this is an episode that is actually going to be a little bit early or a little bit late, depending on when you're tuning in. The episode I planned to get out last week was uh, an interview, and I'm not going to spill the beans on it yet, but we were waiting. Uh, Ken, uh, Ken from Chad Fault 76 Podcast and I got to do an interview with some of the, uh, some of the devs over on the Fault 76 team and we're still waiting to get official approval from the bethesda team to get that episode officially out so i was hoping to get that out last week it never quite happened but i'm recording right now a new episode for you guys with two very cool guests these two guys have shows on the robots rocket club and these shows are some of the coolest shows that i know of in the fallout universe and First of all, I'm going to introduce one of the guys that has been on the Rocket Club for a while now. You've probably heard his show, The Modus Files, Lawrence. Lawrence, how are you doing? Welcome to the show. I'm, well, thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. Uh, yeah, this is our first time getting you on the show. It's been it's been a while. I guess I probably should have done this earlier, but I've been busy with lots of stuff. I know you've been a busy guy cranking out, what, 23 episodes this year? <sighs> A lot. I, I I actually lost track. I I think the last time I checked, it might have actually been twenty nine. So twenty nine. It, it was even even more than I expected. So it was. It's been busy. Oh my yeah. gosh. Yeah. I don't know how. I don't know how you keep up and, and get a show with all the voice actors, all the scripts, all the editing. That's that's so much work. Um. But you, you you've been killing it. You've been getting lots of stuff out there. Congratulations on that. Um. Wrapping up a year of of a really awesome show. Um. And we'll get into a little bit more of that later, but we've got a really cool premise for this episode. And then I also have one of our newer shows on the network, a, a brand new show just released its third episode, Once Upon a Wasteland, a Fallout romance story. And these are these are rare in the universe of Fallout. Very high quality audio, really cool story, really cool voice acting. This is Brad, the, the brilliant mind behind the series. Brad, welcome to the show. Thank you. It's it's uh, it's definitely great to be here and to be here with Lawrence is, uh, is 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 certainly an honor. Lawrence and I have collaborated quite a bit and he's been he's been absolutely invaluable to to uh, to whatever success the show's achieved. So it's great to be on here with with him and with you. Yeah. So um, we have a quick question here in chat. Uh, Villain Behind the Glasses asks, where does one go to listen to these shows? All of these shows are available just like just like my shows on any podcatcher, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, um, Stitcher, anywhere that you can listen to my podcasts, you, your guys shows are also available. So, you know, anywhere that you would normally listen to these shows. Uh, so my shows go listen to, to their shows. Um, so great question, Villain. Uh, but y you guys are I think the perfect guests for our topic for today because we're continuing our what if series with a really cool topic. Both of your shows take place in the setting created by Fallout 76, West Virginia, um, the post uh, falling of the bombs, the 25 years after the bombs dropped. Uh, that's kind of the setting that we get right in, in the Fallout 76 part of the fallout universe and in the fallout universe that we're given in the fallout 76 story we we come into a world that's been not only irradiated with super mutants and the typical fallout stuff but the situation that they are really dealing with when we open up that vault do door and come out of that vault is very specific because there is the scorched plague there <laughs> that's the main issue and we come to learn that the people who were originally out in west virginia were trying to solve this plague and they almost did and they and then they didn't and so the premise for this episode is what if the scorched plague never happened and i know that we, we've been chatting a little bit about this when i invited you guys onto the show and I know that you've done some thinking and you're both writers, you're both very creative. And I know that your minds have probably gone in a million different directions about like, OK, well, how does this domino into this thing and this other thing and this other thing? And I know both of you guys are big lore buffs on everything that happened in the events of Fallout 76 and how the Scorch Plague affected different things, how the different factions went about doing this, but let's take this one step at a time because I, I don't want to talk about necessarily why it didn't happen. I want to talk about like, let's just go from the premise of it just didn't happen. 
where would the story go and how would that affect our playing of the game and the factions that that are there when we open the vault door what would we see when we come out how would the world be different who would like to start what do you think would be one of the first things that would be distinctly different about the world of fallout 76. so i think the most obvious one is we'd actually see people you know that's when we go out of the vault we see nobody there's corpses there's you know then we run into the scorch so the first thing that we're going to see is people and the first people that we're actually going to meet are going to be the responders because they are the ones that actually occupy the forest region um, they're very well organized now there's we have to accept that certain events will still have occurred before the vault door opens mm -hmm. so charles charleston dam will will have been blown up um by right by the raiders right you know, that's going to happen um, so we would expect that the responders are going to be at the airport, but Flatwoods should be a thriving community. Right. Um, okay. So and, let's, let's, let's pause for, for a moment yeah. for those people who are a little bit fuzzy about the lore or for people who, who aren't, haven't necessarily really dug into fault 76. Um, the responders, uh, were, were the group of survivors who were left in the wasteland and came together to try to help the, the people who were stuck out in the world. And they, they came to blows with some other factions who were in the world, mainly raider raider groups. And we won't get into all the nitty gritty details, but there were definitely some there was some there was some bad blood between some individuals and a dam was exploded and took out some innocents and some of the, the responders. And you actually see the, the remnants of, of this in Fallout 76. There's a large swath of land that used to be the reservoir and the dam that is now empty it's it's all been washed away so we would still see the results of that is what you're saying um but we would still see that the responders would still exist you don't think that the raiders or the responders would necessarily have gotten the one up on each other so so i think it depends on how how deep you really want to get into it because i i would imagine that the responders were probably too well organized to to be wiped out mm -hmm. i i don't necessarily think they would be the pre predominant faction in the region you know if, if we think about kind of the story of fallout 76 you have the responders you have the raiders we also have the brotherhood of steel you know this was a faction that existed um it was started by a, a group called taggarty's thunder they were a, a u.s army unit that was in the region for war games um, they became the brotherhood of steel in appalachia um, you had the enclave though i think in in the story that we are are following here or 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 what we're telling it all of that still would have happened or excuse me the enclave in the white spring bunker which was underneath the resort there was a well again we, we can go super deep into that suffice right. it to say i would still wipe the state wipe the slate clean that faction itself wouldn't exist in any tangible way though i have a lot of ideas of how they would play a part in the world um, and then way off in in kind of this region of fallout 76 they call the mire which is Think of it as like the backwoods of Appalachia. Um, you have the free states, and right. these are basically anarchists. Um, so that just kind of gives, I think, our listeners a little bit kind of the lay of the land of the different factions that are around, all of whom would exist in some form or fashion, and we would be able to interact with. So for those who have experienced Fallout 3 and Fallout 4 or even some of the other Fallouts, you would find a, a multi-faction you know, really region that you would start interacting with as a player. So you would find and hopefully have the ability to ally with one or more of them. And there would be a story that we would follow probably built around with the people that actually wanted to rebuild Appalachia versus the people that just wanted power. So you would have, you know, pretty much the Raiders versus everyone else. But I think there's a lot of dynamics between the other factions that would come into play. So right. I'm going right. to stop monopolizing the time here. And no, no, that's that's a that's a great uh, foundation set um the the brotherhood taggarty's brotherhood in the region um was wiped out in a last ditch effort to get rid of the scorched they they were overrun by the scorched and that's that's why they're no longer there um in fact many of these groups were trying to do what they could in order to fight off the scorch scorched plague and that's they either were destroyed or had to leave because they couldn't they couldn't hold them off. Um, so in this situation, you're saying that each of these groups were 
were established enough by the time the vault was open or and, and many of these groups were were actually sadly enough uh came to their end just moments before the vault doors opened seemingly so um so you're saying that we would we'd come out into a wasteland that would be very similar to something like fallout 4. you'd come across factions that were active and there'd be locations like like diamond city or like the brotherhood having a, a you know some sort of base it wouldn't be the predwin flying around in the air but it would be you know a, a base and there'd be actual you know brotherhood soldiers walking around doing their thing and these factions would be more or less competing with or cooperating in some sort of rough structure but none of them you, you think would necessarily get the leg up on each other no, I mean, I think that it's, you know, if you look at the at the lore of Fallout in general, you never really have one faction that's able to establish like preeminent control, mm -hmm. you know, and that's because there's just a an undercurrent of competition that really exists amongst pretty much everyone. I mean, I think the Minutemen in Fallout 4 were probably one of the only ones that wasn't out for really their own power. Right. Um, I think the responders would probably correspond more to them to that that picture of the Minutemen. But, you know, I think you would find a, an Appalachia that would be very dynamic and you would actually have shifting alliances. So I think that you might have the free states cooperating with the responders in some respect. Taggarty's Thunder, you know, this Brotherhood of Steel was actually very militaristic. They didn't cooperate well with civilians. They took what they wanted. Mm -hmm. um, now, of course, if you remove the scorched, are they as militaristic? I think you might actually be able to make the argument that the super mutants might become the bigger threat and still force the Brotherhood of Steel or mm -hmm. Taggarty to to take that hard lined approach, which would then alienate the other civilian factions. So, I mean, it would yeah. definitely not lend itself to, I think, cooperation. I think in a way it almost creates more conflict right. and, well, and actually conflict between people. Yeah, well, Taggarty's group came directly from the U.S. military. Um, they they did come from that. Now, now, Brad, um, I want to I want to move to you. Do you think do, do you have the same concept here? Do you think that this tracks with what you think would happen? Yeah, I, I think the, the the key is something Lawrence mentioned right at the beginning, which is the the big difference is the sheer number of people, right? So instead of just having a couple of raider factions that are kind of splintered off here and there, you don't have the brotherhood, you don't have the responders. You have these factions that are active that are vying for power or are trying to help or whatever just like you do in Fallout 4. And the the thing that I that I that I really think is it's like if the Scorch Plague didn't happen, Fallout 76 would not be a multiplayer game. It would be another single player game because it would play out exactly, not exactly like Fallout 4, but very similarly to Fallout 4. Um, I think that, you know, it was probably a conscious decision by Bethesda to have that sort of empty open world for players to interact with each other in the absence of that with a more dynamic, a more populated Appalachia. Well, then that part of it is you know, marginalized a little bit. And you would, I think, want to have it play out a little bit more like Fallout 4. Um, Absolutely. The big thing yeah. about the Brotherhood of Steel, though, I I think that Taggarty's, uh, Taggarty does not play well with civilians in general. And I don't think that would change in the absence of the Scorched. And even if Taggarty's Thunder completely wiped out the super mutants, I think that, that would, they would still maintain that standoffish, militaristic, kind of stance and i don't think that they would become a sort of a, a trusted and cooperative faction and and i'm gonna go alanis here i'm gonna say ironically i think that the lost hills expedition that that came out in the way the game actually played out is in a much better position whether knight shin leads it or whether paladin romani leads it to become a more powerful faction by not directly seeking power by by using their discipline, using their uh, military know-how, using their skills at diplomacy, all of those things that they have, um, being led by the God Empress Odessa Valdez to, to help with community outreach. Uh, <laughs> she, she's a character in your story. And so uh, uh, anybody who doesn't listen to your story yet uh, doesn't know, but, um, but, but no, but, yeah, but she's but, one of your main but, characters. Yes. But in, uh, but, <laughs> but, in, but in all seriousness, I think that, the, in, especially if Romani is the one who, who ends up leading that faction, I think that their, their desire to go out there and 
and really cooperate with the community. I mean, in a way, they kind of take up the mantle of the responders in a way. Um, they're not quite as altruistic as the responders. They still have that that imperative to gather and hoard technology. But I think that under Romani's leadership, and I think you know Shin's a little bit more of a softy than than people give him credit for. I think he would also uh, go along in the same way and and have them as that kind of a faction, that kind of Minutemen faction, that kind of responder sort of a faction. But I think one thing that that I was thinking about when when we talk about this the, the lack of a scorch plague is because of the fact that Appalachia was largely unlike the other areas that we've seen in other Fallout games, kind of not free from the effects of the war, but didn't have you know dozens of nuclear bombs dropped on you know carpet bombing the entire region. I think that it would become a destination far from being just a place where people are. People mm-hmm. would flock there from the capital wasteland, from the pit, from all these other places that maybe we haven't even explored. You'd have that. I think you'd have a baby boom because people are yeah. feeling good about themselves. Um, and th- I think that th- they would be optimistic because of the fact that they're not seeing the kind of devastation that other people are seeing in other areas. So, you know, in a way it's, it's, it's really in, it's, it's in a position to become sort of a shining star of what used to be the United States, whether that plays out because people are people and you still have the Raiders and you, you have a more powerful cutthroats faction you have, um, you know, other groups that, that are going to come up that, that didn't come up because everybody left. Right. You're still going to have those struggles for power, as we've seen in the other Fallout games. So it's not going to be, you know, the lack of the Scorched is not a panacea, but it is going to lead to a, a more a more robust, almost a, a renaissance type of environment, uh, separate and distinct from what we've seen in other games. Now, what happens after that, like what happens in 200 years when Fallout 4 takes place? Right. You, nobody talks about Appalachia. Why is that? Right. Um, right. Well, uh, uh, yeah. And, and uh, the Scorched Plague or not Scorched Plague, that could play a huge difference in what mm-hmm. happens in 200 years. Yeah. And and, and, and I mean, I, I people say that, oh, well, you know, Appalachia, something terrible must have happened. And maybe it did. But I, I, I don't think that's necessarily the case. It just could be one of those places. It ended up turning into a place so normal, for lack of a better word, mm-hmm. that it's not worth talking about. You know, you have the Capital Wasteland and that's all wild. You have the pit and you have New California and all these other places that have, you know, there, there's stuff going on there. Whereas then you got Appalachia, which is just kind of this place. Right. You know, right. Maybe. So, yeah. Yeah. But yeah. it also could have gone horribly wrong. And it's just a, <laughs> it's just a big crater now. <laughs> <laughs> it could have. It could have. Um, th- I mean, there's also I mean, I've got I've got some other ideas, but I'll save that for later. Um, so here's here's a thought. And I. I'm going to throw some other ideas out at you guys. I, mean, I know you've got some other ideas as well, but uh, for the first half of this, because we'll take a break in the middle to thank our patrons and stuff, but I, I've got a few other ideas I want to just throw at you. With more humans out in the wasteland and with the major uh, non-human threat no longer being the scorched, and Lawrence kind of touched on this, super mutants still being a major threat, especially with uh, you know a major location in the area that was churning out super mutants we all know that super mutants need humans to turn into more super mutants and with more humans being there do you think that there would be more super mutants there'd be more bodies to create more super mutants with there are vats of fev in the area would they become the predominant threat without Scorch there and with more humans around? I think they'd have to. I think that it's a, I think they're very well established in the lore. Um, you know, you see what they do in the Capital Wasteland. I think it it makes sense. Also, just from a, a perspective of player interaction, they're actually kind of in the middle of Appalachia. It's, you know, if you if you look at the map, West Tech is, is pretty much right in the middle. Yeah. And then you have Huntersville right there. And then you also have the Grafton Dam. You have the Colonel Steakhouse. You have these areas in which super mutants have infested. And I think that if you're going to make a threat that is, I wouldn't say existential, that's, I think, the way that that I would go anyway, because I think if you look at now, of course, the other on the flip side of that, super mutants plus cryptids, you know, if you start thinking about some of the cryptids that have popped up, the question that I always ask is, and this is actually what 
almost well one of the questions that started my podcast was where did the cryptids come from now most of them came from west tech they were right. fev experiments the snallygaster fev experiment the grafton monster fev experiment right but then you have the mothman then you have the flatwoods monster yeah you have wendigos you know and and these are quote unquote cryptids that came from somewhere now i i suspect and i'm going to throw this out there is that there was a lot more going on at arctos pharma than we have actually been let in i mean we mm. we see the basement you know we know that there were a lot of experiments that were going on there um and actually the sheep squatch supposedly the sheep squatch came from arctos pharma what else were they doing i think that that's actually the dark horse in this whole conversation which is west tech was bad it's possible that Arctos Pharma was worse and then eliminate the scorch plague. Suddenly those experiments don't end when the bombs drop, because what are those researchers going to do? Yeah. Well, you know, so I think I think that's actually a, a legitimate question you can throw out there to say, hey, maybe it's not just super mutants. It's actually a. I don't know if you want to call it a cryptid threat. I mean, maybe that's what it is. It's actually a cryptids plus super mutants because they're naturally related to each other. Mm -hmm. You know, it's a mutant threat is, is what it mutant is. Mutant threat. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. And, and I think one of the things that we've learned throughout Fallout, not just 76, but all the Fallout games is whatever we see on the surface that, that we know is going on that's bad. There's probably things that are 10 layers deeper than that, that we that are alluded to or hinted at or implied that are much, much worse. And I think that that what Lawrence is saying really plays into that. Uh, I, I you know, I mean, it's headcanon, but I, I always feel like, you know, Vault 76 is supposed to be the, the, the good vault, right, where it's it's one of the only vaults that actually did what its mission was without any kind of ulterior motives. Mm, I don't think Vault Tech really did that. I think that there was <laughs> some stuff going in. Sure. I mean, they, they really did work toward the, the, their stated goal uh, earnestly. But I, I also think that there was a lot more going on in Vault 76. And it, it would follow that there's also a lot more going on at Arctos. There's maybe even additional things going on at West Tech that we that we didn't find out about yet and all those other kinds of things. So, yeah, I, I, I think that I guess part of part of what I wonder when we have a conversation like this is, do you look at it as a historian? Like, do you look at it and say, OK, if this doesn't happen, then what plays out? Um or do you look at it as a storyteller, as if you're saying, I am developing Fallout 76 five years ago or, how, you know, six years ago, however long ago it was they started developing it. This is the way that I could tell my story with the Scorched Plague or without the Scorched Plague. How do I tell that story if there is no Scorched Plague? So I, I think that it's mm -hmm. it's a fundamental difference in how you want to look at it. And I think I I guess I kind of play both sides of the coin when when I was thinking about it, but I tended to look at it a little bit more from, from a historian's perspective of, okay, this uh, Nexus event didn't happen. Like, mm -hmm. you know, uh, yeah. Henry the eighth didn't behead his first wife. Sure. You know, a, a Nexus event, what happens after that? Not I'm writing a novel about what happens if Henry the eighth doesn't chop his first wife's head off. Um, right. So, I, you know, so there, there's, there's a couple of different ways to look at it. And I think that, that those, those different ways fundamentally alter the way that things would play out. Right. I got you. I got you. Um, yeah. Interesting. Because you, it tracks in different ways in your mind when you play it mm -hmm. in different ways. Um, one other thing before we go to the mid break, the, the other thing that we get, the other potential threat group that's unique to Fallout 76 are the mole miners. And the, Whenever there are dangerous threats in an environment, there's there's always an equilibrium that happens. And we see it from the perspective of the humans who have to live there. And as a human in the wasteland, we have to deal with mutant animals and scorched and um, super mutants and, of course, feral ghouls. I mean, they're in. But that's that's part of the mutant threat. Right. I'll lump them into the super mutants and stuff. And but then there's mole miners. And they're new to this, but we don't ever look at it from the perspective of like, how do these things all get along with each other? And just like animals in the wild, there's there's a balance. I'm sure the mole miners and the scorch don't necessarily get along either 
or the super mutants and the mall miners or the super mutants and the scorched or, you know, it, like they're all competing for resources. They're all competing for land. So what happens with the mole miners if there aren't scorched? Do the mole miners stay in their hidey holes? Are they happy to live underneath the ground? Um, do less scorched civilians mean that there's more humans in those places where the mole miners would have been? And so the humans are now ferreting out the mole miners from those locations because they want the resources in those locations. Like, do you have any thoughts about how this would affect that part? So, so I'm really glad you brought up the mole miners because I'm actually I'm, I'm putting a lot of research into them because there's a lot of cut content that didn't actually make it into Fallout 76 mm -hmm. yet about the mole miners. So if we think about who the mole miners are, these were people who were downtrodden. They were, you know, they were strike buster robots that were literally killing them before the bombs. Yeah. So so they are about as anti business anti people as you can get and then of course now they're they're mutated and they're stuck in these these things i actually think that they could be a very significant threat in in their area i think the ash heap would would pretty much become uh that their territory mm -hmm. um and i could definitely see them and they, they they do so i think they would really view that almost as like um like their home and they would they would really be aggressive towards anybody or anything that was trying to move into their home because now all of a sudden of course now they're mutants but they have gotten the the backs of business off of them they're not working for the gear hands anymore they're not working for the horn rights um i think that there's a lot of potential there and there's some intelligence with, going on underneath that they're they're still mm, i mean they're not completely wild well, if you if you read there, if you actually look at the at the translated dialogue lines, yeah, it yeah. is creepy what they talk yeah. about. Yeah, I well, mean, we talked with are... the devs about this, and that stuff. Uh, we were told that stuff isn't necessarily supposed to be taken as canon. That that they just had to write lines to to use. That the actual translation isn't supposed to be canon, but um, it does it does appear that they seem to be intentionally doing things. Whether those lines are are translated verbatim or not they are saying things they do have a language they they seem to be coordinating with each other they are living and mining and working together there's they're not feral ghouls they are they seem to be intelligent at least on some level still so but one one thing about the about the mole miners though and and if I if I have my lore wrong here, correct me. But we talked about super mutants and how without the scorched as a threat, the super mutants would have all these people to make into new super mutants. Mm -hmm. That could be something that increases their number and makes them more of an invasive species than they are now. Right. I don't think. And again, correct me if I have this wrong. There aren't more mole miners being made. Uh, yeah, as far as we know, I don't think so. Like, like because the, I like think there, like there's there a limited miners number. Still, right, there, right. There aren't still miners trapped in there who aren't mole miners now they're just so whatever numbers we have are uh that's that's the number of mole miners that we will have moving forward so if it becomes a war of attrition which i think it would be you know look at the civil war for example or world war one you know have, you have these wars of attrition and a lot of the uh the balance of power depended on your reinforcements the, mm -hmm. the reinforcements you had available if the mole miners don't have any reinforcements well eventually these humans are going to kill them all or the super mutants are going to kill them all um and maybe they they just they turn into the the dwarves from Lord of the Rings um, and, yeah. and just hole up inside the mines and make that their stand. And like the humans get to the point where they say, OK, you know what? It is not worth the the number of lives we will lose to take this area away from them. They're not coming out. We're not going in. They can they can hang out there forever for all we care. We will live above the ground. Maybe they can have their trash heap. We don't need it anyway. <laughs> you can have right. your stupid minds. Yeah. 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 I, West West Wales. Yeah, possibly. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Well, I want you guys thinking about some of the other things that we haven't discussed yet, because I know you have some more thoughts on this. And I also want some of your craziest takes. I want just uh, some of your like furthest down the line. Like if all the dominoes topple, where do you think like these like where do you think this could really, really go? Like what's your craziest take? Like if things really went off the rails, 
where do you think it'll go? And we'll be right back because we got to we got to thank our patrons. So we'll be right back. Hello there, old chap. Good to see another of General Atomic's finest still eager to serve. All right. So this is the part of the show where we get to thank our patrons because you guys are freaking amazing. And welcome Gamer Whirl, our newest patron to the Patreon. Thank you for signing up. And uh, to all 40 or I'm sorry, 54 of our patrons. Thank you for being here. And we get to thank our Sentry Bot Southern Rage for being our tier five patron. And you get our tier five patrons and tier six patrons get calls out every week. Uh, Pie Man had to step down. He reigned as our tier six patron for I think it was, I don't know, six, seven, eight months. I, I don't know the actual count. But Pie Man, thank you so much for your support for such a long time. Buddy, you've been such a such a wonderful supporter of the show, and I know that you're starting your own Fallout show coming up very soon on the Robots Radio Club, uh, Ro- Robots Radio Rocket Club, uh, called the Fallout Roundtable, and that you're working on that. So stay tuned for that because that's going to be a fun show coming up. Um, but th- if you're interested in helping to support the show, and we've done anything to help you get through your workday, your commute, your workout, or getting through your holiday treats that you still have from from uh halloween because we know that you you still have those they're they're just gonna sit in your closet and not not your closet your pantry yeah don't put your treats in your closet that's a terrible place to put them put them in your pantry you still have them in a bag because you got way too many of them and they're still in there and we're about to have more holiday treats if you haven't gotten more already and you're still trying to eat them all and if you're going to be binging on this holiday treats and you need to listen to a podcast and you're listening to this one and you want to help help us out, then go to patreon.com slash falloutlorecast and check out all the different tiers and get the ad-free episodes and maybe even t-shirts, which are beginning to go out, which is awesome. And if you haven't updated your address, and a few, a few of you guys haven't yet, actually almost all of you have updated your addresses, but there's like two people who haven't. I sent you notes, so please go update your addresses because I want you to get the cool stuff that you're paying for. And yeah, check your mail because t-shirts are going out. All the cool stuff. So thank you to everybody who helps support the show. I really appreciate it. You guys are the absolute best. All right, let's get on with the rest of the show. Here we go. If you have any questions about Nuka World, I'd be delighted to answer them. All right, guys. So, <laughs> Brad, let's let's jump to you. We've been starting with Lawrence a bunch. Do you have any other thoughts about what would happen if the Scorch Plague didn't exist that we haven't covered yet? Well, so I think one thing that we haven't really talked about is what happens to Thomas Eckhart mm. in the absence of him unleashing the scorched plague. And, and I guess we can stipulate for the purposes of this discussion, the experiments just didn't happen or it didn't, didn't work out the way that they did in the way that the game actually played out. So there is no scorched plague for him to unleash. Right. I, I think right. Lawrence may have mentioned this before. I think that the, the enclave stuff probably plays out the same. I think Modus ends up killing everybody. Uh, still, but what if he didn't, what if Thomas Eckhart, Mm. his, his, his dreams and delusions of power came to fruition in that, that, that power vacuum without an overwhelmingly strong faction with, with Taggarty's thunder uh, sort of isolated because of their distrust of civilians. Right. I mean, you could, you could really see it wouldn't play out exactly the same, but because of that distrust, you could almost see them, working out like like a nascent version of the institute because we know from from the discussions in fallout 4 the institute tried to work with the people that were in the commonwealth but mutual distrust on both sides doomed that is is the way that they explain i'm sure that there's deeper dives of the lore than i've read but basically they tried to work together didn't work out for whatever reason and the institute became evil and i know there was the show about what if the institute wasn't evil Uh, but but i think that there's the possibility that they become a version of that a brotherhood of steel version of that where they they're like all right fine you guys want to be like that we're going to go off over here and we're going to get our technology and you're going to see you're you're doomed um so if that happens if the responders uh, end up doing their their altruistic thing and just helping people earnestly and honestly helping people maybe david thorpe's cutthroat gang doesn't get uh into a, a a position of actual power right so there's a little bit of a power vacuum so if thomas eckhart doesn't die if modus doesn't kill him mm-hmm. and he is able to sort of emerge into appalachia he's i think we've seen and this this is more real world than fallout if you have a someone who people believe to be a strong leader if, if enough people believe that person to be a strong leader 
I think people have a natural uh, instinct in times of crisis to veer to authoritarianism, which would play right into him. So I think he wouldn't have much trouble getting people, all these people that live in Appalachia since they haven't been killed by the scorched since he didn't, since he wasn't able to unleash them. So you could, you could realistically see, and when we're talking, you know, you're talking about crazy ideas, you could see Appalachia becoming the new seat of power in what used to be the United States led by Thomas Eckhart and a dynasty formed wow. By, wow. by by him and his and his his heirs or his his chosen successors you know it, it could be uh you know a, a family dynasty like the kims or yeah. or like the or like the czars or it could be something like uh the the soviet union where it's it's you know the, the next the next person up becomes the becomes the the the, the leader and like a, like there, a remnants of america like we are right. the true united states yeah we are and, the and, and, and he could even I, I think the free staters would probably be the ones who would oppose that the most strongly, but you yeah. wonder, you wonder how well would they be able to oppose it? Well, if Maybe they have, they, if they have the full brunt of the, the technology and the, the wealth of knowledge that the enclave has at mm-hmm. their disposal, then the free state's not going to, not going to have a whole lot. I mean, they have a whole lot of, uh, guts, a whole mm-hmm. lot of they got they got moxie a whole lot of moxie but 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 but, but really, those assaultrons I mean, I, are gonna yeah you you, you have that when you, ha- you know they're, they're like the ghostbusters you know thomas eckhart and the enclave they got the tools and they got the talent <laughs> and i and and at the very least i think you have a regional dynasty and at most that dynasty expands out and yeah you know maybe yeah. the eastern seaboard maybe half of the united states maybe the whole united states mm-hmm. uh but but i i don't think that there's that there's much of a limit given the his ambitions of power his his hunger for power is probably a better way to put it and the technology that he has behind them the brotherhood of steel is it's it's, it's still early days for the brotherhood of steel i don't think taggarty's thunder would, would pose much of a threat to 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 that force at all and i don't think that maxon's original brotherhood of steel out in california once they catch wind of what's going on uh they would probably want to stop what's going on in Appalachia, but Eckhart may say, Oh, I heard about these guys over in California. I'm gonna go wipe that out. Cause I can. Yeah. Can you imagine, you know? can you imagine a modus, a not insane or dangerous modus, a modus that no. was, well, <laughs> no, <laughs> but uh, <laughs> let's take that another step. Uh, <laughs> one, one that was able to be controlled and programmed to coordinate any of the robots that they discovered in search and reconnaissance of other robotic technology and in search and reconnaissance of any other um, uh, former United States uh, members of the United States government, um, military, anybody else that that was was at least in some way true to the original intent of the United States government pro enclave any of that stuff and you give that mission 10 15 20 years and you send out all the all the assault trons all the mr handies all the all the technology that you could muster out from west virginia which is in the middle of the of the east coast you know you send them out to ohio you send it out to the west to the east coast states you send it down to the south and you have all of that stuff come and with with the with the job, especially the bots, with the job of finding and reprogramming any other robotics that they find, and basically indoctrining <laughs> any technology with the the agenda of doing the same thing, and then bringing back all of that technology to the White Springs. Well, and and, and we see that even with with the uh, with the bots on parade event. You know, that, that 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 exists so like the ability to do that exists. And we see it on a very small scale. So that's clearly part of what Modus has the ability to do and what the what and not just Modus, but the the, the infrastructure has the capability of doing. So that's right. that's that's something that I think, if not necessarily planned, it's certainly a feature that they that 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 they had in mind. Right. And, um, and you don't do it from like an uh, yeah, Neil Patrick Hairless. That's a wonderful name uh, in chat says it wouldn't work. That level of uh, intelligence power would inevitably turn into Skynet. You don't give it an AI that's smarter than a human. You give it a set of instructions, just like a computer. You give it a simple marching order set of instructions, not the ability to think on its own. 
but the, the so here's my my feelings about modus are modus is in a lot of ways he's hal 9000 modus didn't go crazy because he was fundamentally flawed modus went crazy because he had humans behind him who were doing bad things or things that that ran contrary to what his programming can sort of comprehend so just like hal 9000 killed bowman and pool because he was told to lie mm. modus ended up killing everybody because of the actions of the humans that were around him so you know i i think that if a computer is a tool right how how was supposed to be a tool modus is supposed to be a tool and ai can be uh, an important and powerful tool within that but what it depends on and the problem is you and i all of us here have met human beings uh humans always manage to screw it up you know if 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 if, if done properly a, a tool like that can have almost limitless power and, and doing what you're talking about giving it the marching order to say basically saying go forth and multiply right is what is what you're right. saying yeah now. and bring and bring um, everybody back and let's yeah. let's make this the seat of power and then create a 10-year plan to now create a <laughs> an army and a headquarters with the technology and manpower that nobody in the country will ever be able to, to, to com- combat basically. Yeah. And, and, and it's the kind of thing that if, since you're doing it 25 years or 30 years, however many years after the bombs fell, you know, whenever Eckhart's plan goes into, goes into effect, you're not doing it in the time of fallout four mm-hmm. when there's already all this other you know stuff established out there, you're, you're hitting it very very close to the beginning when society is just barely getting to the point where it's starting to reform and everyone's needy and there are people who 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 remember the united states there are people who are going oh this is this this is the message i've been waiting for somebody from the united states government is saying that that we're rebuilding and to head to appalachia to head to west virginia this is where the new headquarters is they have jobs they have work they have food they have clean water they have they have land well, especially, up. especially given that we are operating under that sort of 1950s, heck yeah, America, heck yeah, America of, <laughs> uh, you know, that where, where that would be, people would be very receptive to that. Yeah. You know, more so than today. Like if that happened today with, you know, with today's society, people would be like, yeah, I'm okay. I'm going to live with these super mutants and mole miners. So you, you can, <laughs> yeah. you can stay over there. But with, with that 1950s era, anti-communist, you know, McCarthy hearing sort of, uh, society, they'd be like, well, hell yeah, man, let's hell yeah, bring I'm, it on. I'm grabbing my, I'm grabbing my shotgun and my shopping cart, <laughs> filling it up and we're going. Yeah. Yeah. What do you think, Lawrence? Do you think that this would work? So, so I'm going to throw a bit of a curveball okay. because I think you actually have to remove Eckhart from the equation for it to truly come to fruition only because Eckhart was almost a hundred percent focused on wanting to nuke China. Mm-hmm. Oh, um, now, oh yeah, you, you think know, his own agenda so, will get in the way? Well, well, so that, but I think that if you, if you remove him, I think that there's still the possibility that Modus could put a, I won't say a puppet, but Modus would actually support someone who would almost have the exact same agenda and maybe actually work it in a more positive way so that you could actually have this, you know, rather than, because Eckhart's, you know, would be very power hungry. You have somebody like, um, I'm trying to remember the name. Oh, Santiago. So you you put Santiago in charge and there's the, you know, Colonel Santiago comes out of the White Spring with her, you know, U.S. soldiers in U.S. uniforms backed up by U.S. bots mm-hmm. and mm-hmm. and articulates that same message. Now, Modus Pro-America. is all about efficiency. And if he sees that there's somebody that's going to be more efficient, that's where he's going to put his support behind. So I think that all of a sudden now we as a player could arrive in an Appalachia where there's actually a power struggle between a nascent U.S. government yeah. and factions like the Raiders and the Free States and even the Brotherhood of Steel going like, well, wait a second, Maxon told us that the U.S. government was bad, so we want to fight these guys. So right. we as a player suddenly have to make a choice. Yeah, Do we support what is functionally the U.S. government or do we support people who are like, well, no, these are the same people who started the war in the first place. Right. We want our freedom. So, yeah, I mean, that's a that's a really cool scenario that you could play out. That's a huge dilemma for the player mm-hmm. because that like in Fallout 3, the Enclave is very clearly the bad guy. They kill your father, right? They're set up to be like, mm, these guys say they're America, but they're the bad guys. Come on. 
right? In this scenario that we've just come up with here, it seems like if, especially if Eckhart isn't in the equation anymore and Modus isn't like the crazy, you know, creepy AI underneath everything, this, this seems like, shouldn't I go with them? Sh shouldn't I be on that side? But then if, but wait, the Brotherhood's supposed to be pretty good. I mean, I like the, except for, you know, Maxon being kind of a racist in Fallout 4. <laughs> I mean, they're, the Brotherhood's pretty good, but I mean, but the Free States, can, they can be pretty good too. The first responders are, but those guys are pretty good too. But these guys say that they're America, but these other groups are against them. Like that, could, that creates a real dilemma, you know, especially for the player, especially as an American, you're going, well, these, this, it seems like they're, they have the right plan here, but I can totally see how in this scenario, that group could become way too powerful way too quickly and in any scenario where one group outgrows the power of every other group all it takes is one leader with the wrong agenda to misuse all of that power wait well, so are you guys familiar with the star trek episode patterns of force I don't know them mm -hmm. by name, but oh, I have patterns of force is the, is the Nazi episode. Okay. It's mm -hmm. so, so you had this, the, the, the Federation guy who goes to this planet and he's like, Hey, this system of government could actually work if you had somebody who wasn't just the most evil human, one of the most evil human <laughs> beings in the history of mankind running right. it, like, you right. know, the efficiency and all this other stuff. I think that's similar to kind of what we're talking here. If you replace Eckhart with Santiago or somebody else, who's again, not unrepentantly evil, but does the same thing happen where that benevolent leader, that that good leader ends up because humans suck, gets, you know, drugged or whatever happens and, and they get marginalized somehow. And that that other person because of and you know, you, you say absolute power corrupts. Absolutely. If we're talking about by far the most powerful group uh, and the one that, that is in prime position to, to rule the United States, you know, the rule what used to be the United States, there's going to be a lot of people out there who have the same sorts of ambitions, not the necessarily the nuking China part, but the same power ambitions as Eckhart and will do everything they can to seize that power from whoever that, that benevolent leader is. And again, it just comes back to, uh, you know, war never changes, but humans never change either. You yeah. know, the humans yeah. have an, an infinite capacity for messing things up so and and i guess that 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 makes a good video game and that makes a good story because if every if everybody's perfect if everybody and this is a terrible thing for me to say but <laughs> if everybody lives happily ever after well where do you find the drama in that oh sure um, oh sure but that's but that's why drama is so interesting is because that's what real life is like mm -hmm. you know li life is not just easy sailing Mm -hmm. You know, reality is not easy sailing. Our history is not the stories of just everything going easy and simple. It's like our history is complex and it's tragic. And that just when you think things are going to be fine, they're not <laughs> like this is the way and, the and world can, actually and works. Can, and, and you can still get to a positive outcome, you know, whatever. Oh, yeah. And sometimes and, when you think things are down and out, things work out. And, and, and part of, of it, nowhere. part of it, too, is that I, I've used this phrase in, in my story. It's what does happily ever after look like you know it the happily ever after for this story with 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 uh what happens in appalachia it may still be a happily ever after but it doesn't look anything like what you may have envisioned a happily ever after for this society looking like afterwards so maybe it's not santiago who rules it but santiago gets shoved off to the side by somebody evil but then some other leader rises up and seizes power from whoever takes that uh, take, takes over for Santiago yeah. and and ends up putting something in place that's better than what would have come before. You know, sort of like I was talking about with, I think that the um, the, the Romani Shin Brotherhood faction is better positioned for long term success in Appalachia than Taggarty's Brotherhood faction would have been had they survived. It's it's kind of a similar thing where if you if you asked Maxon at the beginning said, hey, listen, uh, do you want this uh, your your Brotherhood faction in Appalachia to get wiped out? He's going to say, well, uh, no, obviously not. But after, you know, if 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 that was the way that things played out and the Romani Shin faction ends up being 
uh, you know, a, a powerful force in the region. Well, he was, you know, he, he he's going to be OK with that. So that that quote unquote happily ever after wasn't the one he was picturing, but it ended up being better than the one that he was picturing. And that kind of thing can happen. I like happy endings. I'm I'm a sucker for those, which I don't know why I play Fallout, but <laughs> <laughs> so um so lawrence uh we're getting closer to the end of the episode here do you have any like crazy crazy like what ifs where this oh, might I, possibly go so the the one that we haven't even discussed yet and and actually a personal favorite of mine is david thorpe you know here was a a, an ex- a pre-war executive who took a bunch of vacationing upper class people and turned them into ruthless raiders Mm -hmm. And if you look at what he was able to accomplish in just a short number of years, you know, the Raiders were everywhere. I mean, they were a legitimate threat. They stole technology from the Brotherhood. They, you know, they camped out like literally at the doorstep of the responders. So in my mind, I think you I think they're the dark horse as far as becoming the preeminent faction in Appalachia, because Mm. David had a brilliant mind. He was incredibly organized. And he could convince people to do whatever he wanted. So I think if we think about a crazy scenario, I actually could potentially see the Raiders becoming the faction. And and God forbid they should get access to the silos. Uh-huh. I mean, imagine a Raider faction with access to nuclear weapons. What and, if a Raider and, faction organized like a corporation? Yes, yes. That <laughs> it's a little bit on the nose, I think. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, you, I mean, that's that's actually, I think, the the existential threat really that that we could find ourselves facing is a a raider faction that matures. So mm-hmm. imagine David because he wipes out the mistress of mysteries. Maybe he actually gets access to um, cryptos. You know, yeah. so I think that that's you know maybe you have a white spring. Um, a white spring uh, raider war that goes on that you have the technology of the white spring but they don't have the numbers you have the raiders that have the numbers plus the intelligence yeah and you know that's a that's a really interesting scenario to get into i mean the smart raiders basically turns into the mob yeah that's what i was thinking i was thinking exactly the same thing you it's you maybe get a similar power structure to something like the godfather where you have these mm-hmm. incredibly powerful you know say the call of the five families one raider organization that are incredibly powerful I, I, it wouldn't play out exactly the same way because i think they would be much more overt in their power like they would be quote unquote law enforcement they would be uh, mm. uh commerce out in the open they would they would be much more entrenched in in legitimate business than, than the mafia in the real world was and they wouldn't operate nearly as much in the shadows like a corporation they yeah. would be sort of really out there and very proud of what they were doing and but also again, I think I, I, and I, yeah, yeah, cutthroat. I mean, cutthroat was, is the is the perfect name for that for that raider faction. But yeah. and and it's and it's a little it's a little on the nose. But I mean, they would they act a lot like a regular corporation in like the real world would. Um, they just mm-hmm. wouldn't have to worry about laws. Yeah, but not because that be corporations no, often no, do now. But well, there's no there's an absolutely no oversight. Mm-hmm. There would be none. They they would be the oversight, and and again, it, yeah. it would it would end up being you know maybe they're not the only raider faction, maybe they're the preeminent raider faction, but you get you know something like the crater raiders, uh, also you know some form of that of that group, um, and they operate like another mob family, and there's that sort of an organizational structure over it. And I guess if you want to be in power, then in Appalachia, you have to be some form of a raider gang. Man, this, um, this starts you, turning maybe, into cyberpunk. This starts turning to like Arasaka. And Militech. Mm-hmm. Yeah, no, and, and it's that, that's actually a really interesting rabbit hole to go down yeah. because y- you would have the Brotherhood of Steel, but Raiders, right? They still call themselves the Brotherhood of Steel. They still operate in certain ways, like maybe they're super racist and maybe their their imperative specifically is to gather and hoard technology and to record mm-hmm. information, but they're still Raiders. Right, and, but, but they're not afraid to kill people. And just take yeah. it from them where the brother, he'll, the, the brotherhood will negotiate and they mm-hmm. have a, they have a moral compass and they will, you know, they treat people like people and they will negotiate and they, there's there are certain lines they, they will not cross. Whereas the Raiders will just march into town, kill everyone and take the technology and they won't mm-hmm. even bother with the with the pleasantries. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. It, it, it would be like a mirror universe version of the brotherhood. Right. 
I, I know two Star Trek references in one episode. They all have goatees. Yeah, right, yes. <laughs> they, they all have goatees. Yeah, that would be their that would be their uniform wrap. <laughs> Oh man. Oh my guys, this has been super fun. This has been a really cool conversation. Um, we got to wrap up the show. So here, let's go backwards and we're going to go back through Brad. Thank you for joining me. This has been super fun. Um, your show is, is a lot of fun and it's a very cool take on not only a character that people know from fault 76 Valdez, but some other new characters and things. And I hope people take a chance and go go listen to it it's still very new you're on your third episode how can people get a hold of it and check it out well uh once upon a wasteland a fallout 76 love story is available on all popular podcast platforms as well as probably some unpopular podcast platforms so (laughs) however you listen all of them however however you listen you probably can Uh, i i do have a pinned post on on the show's twitter account which is once upon 76 pod uh i also share some show information there uh commissioned art story snippets all those kinds of things but the important thing is i i do have a pinned post where you can find uh direct links to the show on spotify apple podcast stitcher etc etc um you have some uh well-known voice talent on the show as well i do i am very proud uh, of the of the voice cast that we that we've been able to to assemble here letitia lemon uh is uh plays the the lead character uh, the the main character the 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 audience pov character uh, elizabeth kirby who is a uh a, a, a person who was born in vault 76 and was trained in spycraft and dis- diplomacy and counterintelligence. She's like a Jane Bond, I, I think is a, is a good way to describe her. Um, yeah. And the other, the other lead character, of course, is Odessa Valdez, Brotherhood of Steel. Um, it's, it's a romance as you know, it's, it's right in the title and it is there. Uh, th- those two coming together, uh, falling in love, negotiating, a relationship and all the outside forces that, that sort of come in and, and, and are trying to prevent that from happening, not directly, but just because it's Appalachia and it's kind of a, uh, not, not, not a great place to, to be right now. But there's still, um, there's still like fallout stuff in it. Absolutely. So it's, it's not it's, just it's, like at, roses 100%. and butterflies. <laughs> right. Yeah. It's, <laughs> yeah. it's, it's, it's very firmly entrenched in, in the fallout 76, uh, in the fallout 76 setting. There is, it's not just a romance, there's also an overarching mystery that uh, that does tie into not only Fallout 76 lore, but also some Fallout 4 lore. Mm-hmm. Uh, so so it is it is tied very deeply into the Fallout universe. Uh, it's yeah, it's, it's it's definitely not just a uh, uh, a love story set in West Virginia in in the <laughs> in the late 20 in the uh, in the late 21st or the early 22nd century. Um, so, yeah, so I, I, I feel like there's, there's something for just about, about everybody, you know, there's, there's the love story. There is the, the, the mystery, there's the sci-fi element. There's all that fallout lore. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's a great voice cast. Uh, Odessa Valdez is played by, by vitriol uh, from vitriol plays another, another wonderful and accomplished Twitch streamer. And there's a uh, great voice voice cast, uh, you know, up and up and down the line. Awesome. Awesome. Well, very cool. Well, thank you for joining the show. And then Lawrence, Thank you for being here. How can people listen to the Modus Files? Yeah, so as as with Once Upon a Wasteland, you can find us on um, iTunes, uh, you know, Spotify, you know, it just just about everywhere. Um, but you can actually, but probably the best way is to follow us on Twitter. Um, we're at Modus Files, um, very active there. Um, always talking about what we're doing on the show. Lots of uh, lore around the characters that we've developed. Um, we also have a website, which is uh, modusfiles.com. Um, we've also started uploading our episodes to YouTube. Um, so if you go to Modus Files on YouTube, you can find our episodes there. Not all of them yet. We're still in the process of uploading those. Um, and we did just finish our first season. Um, also, as a bonus to the community, we did a mini series this past year called The Last Days of Appalachia, um, which actually talk about mm. um, it's actually stories based on the last days of each of the factions in Fallout 76. So. Just like we talked about what would happen if there was no Scorch Plague, this is actually kind of the my take or or the our take on what happened to the responders. Like that last couple of days, what what did they experience? What did they see? What did they do? And it, and that's the same for all of them. And and actually, if you listen to that miniseries, there's a pretty big twist at the end that ties back into the main podcast. Not no spoilers there. I'm going to ask you guys to go listen to it. Uh-huh. Um, but uh, but it's great. So like I said, first season is over. Second season is going to start in early 2022. Um, we actually have four full seasons planned um, and we will answer the question why people don't talk about Appalachia and Fallout 3 and 4. Oh, so. interesting, interesting. And uh, in chat, Solid Snake says, we have a Discord. <laughs> Do you have a Discord? 
We do, we do, and 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 unfortunately, I I am not the one that manages the Discord, mm. um, but certainly I'll get that information up on our Twitter feed. So, like I said, anybody here that's interested, um, follow us on Twitter. Um, we'll get that information, and and certainly also encouraging everybody to get on the Discord, and I will figure out exactly what that is. Yes, it's one problem with wearing every single hat is that you know oh. sometimes you you don't end up knowing everything. Oh God, I know. <laughs> <laughs> I know, oh, and, I, and I will say, and, and, and probably as a as a, we mentioned it before, um, so Brad here is actually the voice of Modus. Um, he was one of the first voice actors that I brought into the show. He has been an absolute pleasure to work with, um, absolutely top rate talent, and I, it has just been such a wonderful experience. I don't think I could actually do that, do what I do, without the support of of people like Brad, and especially of Brad. So. Yeah, there's so much there's so much fun crossover in the Fallout community. There's there's always fun stuff going on. So well, I, I, I could also mention that the prologue episode that that I did, which Tom was a suggestion that you made, and I think it was a really good one. Uh, Lawrence provided one of the voices in in the prologue mm-hmm. and did a did a fabulous job of that. So um, I, I encourage you to check that out to hear Lawrence, the voice actor, as of uh, in addition <laughs> to you know after you listen to Lawrence, the the producer, writer, and narrator. You can also check him out as purely a voice actor reading words somebody else wrote. Yeah, you'll hear a lot of uh, recognizable voices when you when you listen through stuff. So, man, that's a lot of fun. And if if this stuff went all really fast and you want to just kind of catch all this stuff, you can always log into the Robots Radio Discord. Each of these shows has its own channel. So don't don't be afraid to just log in and say, hey, what were the links for these things again? What was the name of this thing again? We're always happy to share stuff with you guys if, if there's ever anything you need. Or you can go to robotsradio.net. There's stuff on there. So yeah, you know, any of the stuff you need, don't be afraid to ask. We're always ha- happy to help you guys out. So again, that's uh, Once Upon a Wasteland and The Modus Files, if you guys want to check out those shows. And all of my shows and all the shows on the network, robotsradio.net. And my stuff, if you want to come check out the live shows, are at twitch.tv slash robotsradio. My live video game streams are now on the Robots Radio YouTube channel. And a bunch of the videos that I'm making, I've been doing a bunch of stuff having to do with Starfield lately and taking a look at all the cool Starfield stuff coming and it's just going to get more and more interesting as we get closer and closer to release. I've I've got some I've got some uh, I've, I've been poking people who seem to be a little bit more in the know than I am and I don't know a whole lot for sure but what I do know is that they are hyped for the things that will be released for us to know about. So I'm hyped about that. So I will be sharing anything I learn on the Robots Radio YouTube. So so make sure you're following on there and just come out, hang out with me on game streams. I posted a video today about the plan and the future of my YouTube channel and what I'll be doing with it. And I'd love for you guys to be there and be part of the community. I'm going to use that as kind of like a community hub now. So I want you guys to be part of that. So thanks for tuning in, everyone. I uh, will see you guys next week, I think. We've got a patron episode coming up. I forgot to mention that. Um, that's going to be the last Tuesday of the month. That's on the 28th. That's between two holidays, so that should work out. But that's coming up, and um, I will put up the episode that didn't come out last week as soon as possible. So we'll see you again very, very soon. Thanks for being here, everyone, and stay safe in the wasteland. And if you see a Scorch, to remind him that we just did a What If episode and that he doesn't exist. So... <laughs> Tell them to go away. (laughs) All right, stay safe in the wasteland, everyone. We'll see you later. To plug into everything else we're doing, check out robotsradio.net. Also, look up the Robots Radio YouTube for videos about Fallout and other things. And check us out on Twitter, twitter.com slash robotsradio. You've been listening to a Robots Radio podcast. Smart shows for interesting people. Check out all the shows at robotsradio.net.